reading? Have you thought about it lately? Have you thought about the intricacies of the process? How the pages feel on your fingers as you're turning them one by one? The different letters that you see and how they sound and how those different letters form together to create words and then much larger sentences where you're able to extract the meaning from the text. Have you thought about it lately? When I was a kid, I used to spend my summers at the public library in my neighborhood. I would walk through the different aisles where I would smell the aged pages in ink. I would be so excited to be in the section that contained goosebumps and all of the horror or science fiction books that I could engage with. I could be a member of the Lost Boys tribe fighting alongside Peter Pan against Captain Hook, or I could be a mermaid going against the ocean's floor looking for knickknacks. At that moment, I could be anything that I wanted to be. And if even for a little bit, not a child with reading difficulties. Reading difficulties are a journey. And for me, it was very difficult when I was growing up to learn the process in an effective way. I love to read, but it was just a little bit harder for me to comprehend information while I was reading the text. My mother and my father felt that it was best to enroll me in a learning center where I got help with reading comprehension, um, with my decoding of information, and I received a lot of tutoring and educational services that really helped to prepare me to be a better reader. Because of that support and that love and that that urgency to pour into me and make sure that I was prepared for my future. Now I'm sitting here today as a neuroscience doctoral candidate pursuing a PhD and looking at how socioeconomic status can impact reading ability. Now I keep talking about this term reading difficulties. What are they? Well, reading difficulties affect five to 15% of school age children. And it typically happens around third grade where children aren't necessarily able to make the shift from learning to read to reading to learn. Reading is like building a house. You need the foundations to be able to do the process effectively. So you need language processing, which relies on phonology, your ability to identify speech sounds. You also need your semantics, which is your vocabulary knowledge. And that is also often built in an enriching language environment. You also have executive functions, which is another brick of the house. You rely on inhibition, working memory, your ability to focus on what's happening in front of you. And all of those abilities combined help with your formation of your roof, which is reading comprehension. And so you're able to extract meaning from the text that's right in front of you in order to understand or comprehend what you're reading. I know that we've talked about the behavioral levels of reading, but on the neurobiological level, the brain is like an electrical grid. It contains billions of neurons that are connected and communicating with one another as you're carrying out various tasks throughout your day. And it's absolutely essential that your brain is functioning appropriately for you to be able to carry out various tasks. Now with the brain, a simple view of it is it contains two hemispheres. You have your right hemisphere, which is involved with creativity, and you have your left hemisphere, which is involved with logic and reasoning. And for children that are starting out and they're learning to read, they have increased activation and in frontal regions of the brain showing that they're um, allocating more effort or strain to focusing on the task at hand. But as children become more skilled readers, they rely more so on the left hemisphere of the brain through the usage of the language network. For children who are developing and while they're engaging in narrative comprehension, which is you listening to stories and being able to extract meaning from what you're hearing, we can see that for two different populations of children, first typically developing readers, there's differences in the activation patterns that we see, where we see more localized activation or increased activation within language regions while typically developing readers are listening to stories. 
Before our children with reading difficulties, they were relying more so on a right hemisphere activation where we see more diffused activation patterns within the brain while they're listening to stories. And this can often be translated to them having poor narrative comprehension abilities due to relying more on these functional connections within the right hemisphere. So they're not necessarily making that shift to fluent reading the way that they need to. Emergent literacy is where children are engaging or starting to really learn about the foundations of reading. And that's built within the home literacy environment. So the home literacy environment helps to stimulate the child through educational resources, books, museums, whatever that may be. And as children are developing, at two years old, they're starting to understand single words and they're able to apply what they're hearing in their day-to-day -day lives. You also have participation in symbolic play. So they're engaging and they're playing with their caregiver or their parent. But you also have basic rhyming. Kids are able to know the difference between the word cat and bat, and they know that those two words rhyme together. They're also engaging in understanding stories by age five, which is extremely critical as there's a lot of overlap with narrative comprehension and reading ability. And we need children to be kindergarten ready by at least age five, as it is a predictor of later academic success. Focusing more so on that home reading environment, we know that shared reading is extremely critical for building the foundations for reading acquisition. And studies have shown that the more a mother and child engage in reading, it's related to increased activation within regions that are support visual imagery as well as semantics, which is your ability to know about vocabulary that's right in front of you. So we have talked quite a bit about reading difficulties and the way that they impact a child, but we haven't necessarily looked at how it impacts their self-esteem or their mental health. Children with reading difficulties often have increased anxiety from the process as they are just overwhelmed by the text that's in front of them. In addition, children with reading difficulties often have poor self-esteem. They don't want to engage in reading out loud in the class. They're nervous about the outcomes. Studies have also shown that it's related to school dropouts. And also there's a large amount of the prison population that also have reading difficulties. So when looking at the environment and how it impacts our everyday lives, we know that reading difficulties often have a genetic component. However, there is quite a bit of literature that shows that the environment has extreme impacts on the reading ability for children. And so taking that model a little bit further and looking at how the environment can impact a child's development or now language development, we know that it relies on home literacy environment like we spoke about, but also maternal reading fluency is a critical component of reading ability as a child and a mother are engaging in that shared reading process. So maternal reading fluency has been shown to be positively associated with the synchronization of their child's future reading network while they're listening to stories. And so now that we know that maternal reading fluency is essential for a child's future reading acquisition, as well as their reading related networks and the formation of those networks, what if that child's mother doesn't have fluent reading? Well, we know that it could be related to lower reading frequency, quality, as well as engagement during those extremely critical or sensitive periods during child development. So it's important to explore this concept a little bit further. So for our study, we had 12 four-year-old girls that were recruited for this study. And we also recruited their mothers who had an average age of 20 years old. These mothers were majority low income and then 77% of them reported having a household income that was $15,000 per year. In addition, 67% of these mothers were African American. We now wanted to test these kids' abilities. Now that we had some demographic information on them, we wanted to see where they stand. And so we first wanted to look at nonverbal intelligence. And this doesn't require the child to verbalize anything, but maybe just select different types of patterns that may go together. 
And so for a task, they would have to select whether or not um, which symbol would go within the allotted pattern. And they would do this for a, um, a certain amount of time. In addition, we also wanted to touch phonological awareness. We know that that's a critical language ability and also a predictor of kindergarten readiness. So their ability to know the differences between the different sounds of the letters is really important as they're developing with reading acquisition. And we saw that these abilities were all intact for our kids. In addition, we wanted to test the mothers. We wanted to see where their reading ability was. So we did a sight word as well as a pseudo word efficiency test where a mother had to read a, wrist, a list of real words within 45 seconds and then she had to read a list of non words within 45 seconds. And that tells us a lot about their reading efficiency. In addition, we did a reading comprehension and fluency task. With this particular task, based on the mother's education level, they will have to read a list of sentences within an allotted amount of time and then answer each comprehension question with a true or false response. We also wanted to image the brain. It's not just enough to do behavioral tests, but we want to see what's going on on the neurobiological level of the brain. So we did a resting state, functional magnetic resonance imaging task where all the children had to do was stare at a cross for two five-minute sessions. Now it is a lot harder than it sounds, especially for four-year-olds. We were able to collect the data and further um, analyze how their brains are working during this task. With MRI, it's a super interesting process that's kind of like a roller coaster. You have, while you're doing a task, you have brain fluctuations where um, there is blood flowing to a particular region of your brain while you're carrying out a task. And that's that blood oxygen level dependent response that we're able to measure to look at different activation patterns within the brain. Now, this also tells us a lot about different types of networks that are working together. So if two brain regions are maybe functionally activated at the same time or maybe have a similar time series, there's a chance that they may be functionally connected to one another. And so we can explore those networks a little bit further. So based on the literature, we had our networks of interest. So we have the language network, which we know is extremely critical for later reading ability. We have the default mode network, which is often activated when your brain is at rest or in a daydreaming state. We also have the frontal parietal network, which is involved in speed of processing or being able to allocate your attention to a cue or a stimulus in front of you. And then we have the visual network, which is pretty self-explanatory. You know, what are you seeing in front of you and what is being visually represented? And with those four predefined networks, we use the Con Functional Connectivity Toolbox, which is a computational program that allows us to measure the within network connectivity for each predefined network. And then we're able to correlate that within network connectivity to our maternal reading measures. So we have our sight word and pseudo word efficiency tasks and our reading comprehension and fluency tasks. And we're doing these correlations to our within network connectivity networks of interest. And from that data, what we saw was that the language network was negatively correlated to maternal reading fluency. And we didn't see any associations for the default mode network or the frontal parietal network and the visual network. And so we wanted to take this data a step further and we wanted to do a network to whole brain approach in order to know what other brain regions are functionally connected to the language network when examining maternal reading fluency as a variable. So we did this with the network to whole brain analysis where we're able to look at the average time series of our predefined network, which will be the language network, and we are able to correlate it in order to see what other brain regions may be on that functional time series with our predefined network of interest. So for this data, what we saw was that maternal reading fluency was negatively associated with the language network and eight other brain regions of interest. But for the sake of time, we'll only focus on three. We saw that the left cerebellum and right cerebellum were functionally connected to the language network. In the literature, the traditional view of the cerebellum is that it's involved in motor control and precision of movement. But the literature is now starting to show us 
that it's also involved in language processing, which is extremely important for later reading acquisition. We also saw the left frontal pole, which is functionally connected to the language network. And in the literature, the frontal pole is involved in attention or your ability to allocate that focus to what's happening in front of you. And this negative correlation was also seen for those five other brain regions of interest that were functionally connected to the language network. So this atypical brain behavior relationship and this negative correlation could be really showing us a lot about how these children are um, operating or how they're um, carrying out reading related tasks. So what we see was that the lower the maternal reading fluency, there's this increase in functional connectivity of the language network to brain regions that are involved in semantics, which is important for language processing and cognitive control, which is important for attention abilities. And this relationship could be due to an increased neuronal strain to the language network, to these brain regions of interest, as children are having to allocate more of their attention or their focus to the language that is being said to them by their mothers who may have this lower maternal reading fluency. And so with emergent literacy, we know that it's this extremely important critical process for later reading acquisition. And so children should be meeting these developmental milestones to be able to be ready for kindergarten. So what comes next? Well, we examined these children while they were in preschool, they're engaging in emergent literacy, but we also wanna conduct longitudinal studies where we're looking at these children when they're at school age, so when they're eight to 12 years old. And we wanna know by eight years old, do these children have some form of reading difficulty or have they been able to develop typically for their reading acquisition? We also want to look at other variables to kind of expand this model where we want to understand what's the role of maternal education on reading related networks and later reading ability for children. How does this variable impact this process? So this data has real world um, applications. In the state of Ohio, 32% of Ohio fourth graders perform below the basic proficiency level in reading. And this is extremely critical because a lot of the children who have these deficits or have these difficulties with reading were either low income, African American, or Hispanic children, which shows that there are quite a few disparities in reading achievement for this demographic of children. So for me, it was very important for me to figure out a way to address this head on. And so I decided that Reading Awareness Month needs to be represented in the state of Ohio. And so I reached out to partner organizations within Cincinnati, Ohio, to be able to see if they would be interested in a book drive where we collected almost 700 books for K through sixth grade students that would be equally distributed for them to be able to set up their own at home library. So it was a really amazing initiative and more than ever during the pandemic, children deserve to have literacy um, materials in their households. But also we were able to submit a resolution to Cincinnati City Council. And although it didn't get passed in March because of coronavirus, we were able to get it passed when Cincinnati City Council was able to resume in September on the second and it was so amazing to be able to watch this live stream and know that we have these elected officials that are also on board with knowing that reading should be a priority for elementary school students who are growing up within the Cincinnati area. Poverty has real life outcomes and children who grow up in these households often are at a disadvantage because there's a digital divide. They don't have access to computers or to internet, which can really impact their educational outcomes. But also there are higher rates of language disparities in these households because of the lack of enrichment that's taking place. The priorities are a little bit different. Priorities may be focused on survival and not necessarily academics. In addition, children who grow up in low-income households 
are also more likely to live in school districts that are also poor and don't receive the same amount of resources that other school districts do. So we do see these disparities in access to educational resources that are critical for a child developing. So what can we do? How can we change the outcomes for reading for these kids? Well, we can volunteer and work as tutors in a local elementary school. We can provide them with the tools that they need. In addition to that, we can encourage legislators to designate more funding to neuroscience research that examines reading difficulties. But we can also rely on pre-existing literature in order to inform educational services for low-income families. At the end of the day, their voices need to be represented. So we need to assess the needs of the school districts, parents, and communities by seeing what they need and seeing what is best suited for their ability. Children are so much more than their circumstances. They are our future teachers. They're scientists, counselors. They're future lawyers, CEOs, and legislators. They're future journalists and maybe even the president of the United States. But a child will never know what they can be unless they have the tools and the foundation to be able to succeed. Reading difficulties are a journey. And for me, the process was extremely difficult. I cried quite a bit trying to be able to carry out reading and I didn't have a lot of joy when I was going to school because I knew that I was gonna struggle and that there was gonna be difficulties. But because of support and because I had people like my parents, like my mother, who never gave up on me, I'm standing here today giving you all this presentation about reading difficulties and how they are critically important to address. And so I'm grateful to be here and I'm excited for future outcomes and future career moves where I'm able to impact and advocate for low income communities so they'll have the tools that they need to succeed.